Okay, so the number of uh, participants has stopped ticking up, uh, so we'll just make a start. Welcome everyone, thanks uh, very much for coming along to today's uh, seminar. Um, this is really exciting for us, this, uh, this is the first time really we're presenting um, as a whole uh, the research, uh, the findings from a, a process of research, a uh, research project that we've all been engaged in um, over the last two years, um, where primarily, among other things, I should say, um, we conducted, or, or my colleagues did, <laughs> conducted a programme of ethnographic research um, that critically explores um, some key aspects of, of procedural justice theory. So what we're going to be doing today really is feeding back um, some findings from this research project um, that I think are both really interesting as pieces in and of themselves, um, and also in the way that they fit together um, to say something really quite interesting, I think quite powerful um, about, if you like, procedural justice research and some of the ways that we may want to push that in new directions um, in the years to come. I should have, of course, as I my name is Ben Bradford, I'm Director of the Institute for Global City Policing, and I guess we're bringing this seminar to, to you today in conjunction, very much conjunction, with, with KPAC from Kiel. I'll introduce the, the Director of KPAC, Clever Stott, in, in a second. Um, just a few bits of housekeeping. Um, this is set up uh, as a seminar in, in Zoom, um, so you'll only better see and hear the panelists. If you want to, to raise a question, please use the Q&A function, not the chat function, please use the Q&A function. Um, I will monitor those. Um, so you can post a question at any time in response to what you're hearing. Um, we'll take the presentations one after another, so they'll run seamlessly on from one to another. Then I get to abuse my position as chair uh, by giving a bit of feedback <laughs> or a, a bit of discussion, I should say, um, on, on, on the presentations. And then we'll open up to general Q&A at the end. Um, I'm hoping we should have at least half an hour for that, depending on how many questions you raise, of course. Um, if you want to use the chat functions, we'll talk about yourselves again, please do, but I'm, I'm only going to be monitoring the Q&A. So if you've got an actual question you want to put to the panellists, please put it in there. Um, I should also say that we're recording this um, and we'll make the recording available on the Institute for Global City Policing um, YouTube channel or the JDI YouTube channel or both, who knows. Um, right, um, without um, further ado, I'm going to hand over to, to the first presenter, who is uh, Clifford Scott, uh, who's director of KPAC at Cleo and professor of social psychology there. And he's really gonna be setting the scene, I think, for, for what's to come. So Cliff, over to you. Okay, thank you, Ben. I'm just gonna start by attempting to share my screen. Uh, so if you can let me know that that's sharing okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so thank you for, for the introduction. Uh, just to continue um, that, my role today is really just to set some of the conceptual framework for, um, for the studies that you're about to hear from, from my colleagues. And I thought it would be relevant to do that by just focusing on, on a particular interpretation that I think is, is quite dominant of, of procedural justice theory. And that there's one way of understanding procedural justice theory that seems to be the interpretation that the theory proposes these uh, rules or four factors that if applied in the context of policing is uh, going to lead unproblematically to the perception of police fairness and correspondingly uh, the enhancement of, of police officer and, and police legitimacy. And I think it's that that really was one of the key drivers of how we came to generate this research project in the first place because it's, it's arguably a very simplistic, uh, narrow interpretation of procedural justice theory that runs the danger of, of, of reifying um, the, the, the rules, uh, treating them as if they're fixed and universal rather than the outcome of, of complex social processes. And that it's really important to recognize that procedural justice theory also talks to us about the importance of understanding how these rules occur in a particular context. And we need to be conscious of uh, the way in which this abstraction of the rules potentially runs a danger of reifying through decontextualizing the context within which they occur. And, and today then we're going to offer a series of interrelated presentations from some superb early career researchers that I have the, the, the privilege and honor to work with really, uh, who've brought some in exciting um, insights and, 
um, methodologies uh, to, to our, our work that you'll hear about uh, in the next presentation, in the next uh, three presentations. So my job here today is really to set those in context by introducing what, what we refer to as a, as a process model of, of procedural fairness. And this work has been made possible through funding from the ESRC. So obviously I want to extend my thanks to that organization for funding our project to make this work uh, possible. And through, the, through this first presentation, I want to, to raise then uh, three uh, core issues really. Uh, the first is that um, arguably uh, procedural justice theory presently focuses uh, too much, or certainly the literature around procedural justice theory focuses too much on research on the general population and only infrequently on, on subpopulations. And where it does it res its research, it's, it's very much focused on why people obey the law and not necessarily why they break it. And there's also a heavy reliance on, on survey data and correlational analysis across large populations. And arguably that's understandable because uh, the focus has been on theory validation. But the work here is really then to try to take procedural justice theory onwards through a process of theory development. And in that theory development, we want to highlight limitations in contemporary understanding um, by focusing on the role of social context and the importance of interactional dynamics as mediators of, of fairness, um, uh, legitimacy, um, and, and compliance. Now, procedural justice theory has, has a strong background in, in psychology and in social psychology in, in particular. Um, and early models of procedural um, justice theory draw upon on these assumptions, early assumptions about the, the nature of human psychology. And in particular, um, early procedural justice theory iterations draw upon social exchange theory. There's also um, more recent uh, iterations draw on, on group value model and, and group engagement model uh, approaches, which emphasize together the importance of group social identity and social processes uh, in how we need to understand how procedural fairness and procedural justice works. But, from a modern social psychological perspective, there's some problems here because these early models are based around particular assumptions of uh, the rational self-interest of individuals. And they were part of a broader intellectual trend um, of the individual as a rational actor that became very dominant uh, and popular in the, in the latter 20th uh, century. And these ideas of um, individual rational cost benefit analysis uh, lie at the heart of some of the thinking about the psychology of group process uh, that feeds its way into a contemporary understanding of, of how procedural fairness uh, processes uh, operate. And I think it's fair to say that these early models of individual and group psychology from which procedural justice theory uh, originally drew are now outdated. Uh, and as a function, misrepresent uh, contemporary understanding of how and why group psychology might play its role in the interactions between police officers and citizens. And these early social exchange uh, models have been superseded by, by um, identity-based models, um, which draw on the idea of a, a process uh, through which our, our identity is the psychological basis through which we engage in uh, group, uh, group behavior and intergroup uh, relations. And by seeing identity in this way and understanding um, the role of identity in the dynamics of, of intergroup relationships, our approach has allowed us to make uh, considerable developments in our understanding of uh, the dynamics governing perceived legitimacy um, in the encounters between police officers and citizens in the context of, of the crowd. And these ways of understanding uh, identity psychology have, have helped us to, to advance our understanding of identity itself. Because where we study identity in the crowd, what we start to see is that social identity is, is, is a dynamic collective self-representation, a sense of, of who we are that is fundamentally linked to its surrounding 
uh, social context, both the immediate social context, for example, of the exact interaction between a police officer and, and, and citizens, but also the proximal or structural uh, social context. And what we see through our work on the crowd is that police perspectives and their psychology feeding into their actions play a really important role in shaping and reshaping the context from which the identities that drive collective action in a crowd both form and change across time. So while these identities uh, and interactions take place within a, a structural context, which is relatively fixed, the dynamics of these interactions between police and, and participants in the crowd um, appear to be based around power relationships um, dynamic power relationships that can change over time, and also dynamic perceptions of police legitimacy and illegitimacy uh, that can change during uh, a crowd event. So what we understand from the dynamics of, of, of interactions between police officers and, and citizens in the crowd context is legitimacy and power are, are really quite important. And that also uh, this shared sense of illegitimacy or legitimacy can emerge through interaction with the police in the context of the crowd event itself. And correspondingly, if we can shape police action to create or facilitate strong collective perceptions of police fairness, this can lead to shared identification with the police among people in the crowd that can last uh, for the duration of the event and indeed beyond that event itself. So people may have a perception of police illegitimacy, they encounter uh, policing that's legitimate, they can form a shared identification with the police and take that identity away with them and see the police as legitimate after encountering, encountering them in ways that they experience uh, as legitimate. So these, these processes correspond with, with norms of self-regulation so that where crowd participants perceive their relationship with the police as legitimate, what we see is they start to self-regulate. So disorder or, or crime in, in an abstracted way um, within that context uh, reduces. So more legitimacy, more self-regulation, less disorder. So it suggests a complex interactional and longitudinal processes at work here, not a fixed uh, universal set of rules. So what it also tells us is that encounters with the police are often identity-based intergroup interactions. So while, while an ind individual might be interacting with police, the identity that that individual has salient when they're in that interaction and indeed the group membership uh, that police officers perceive that individual in terms of um, is, is about group identity. It's, it's about uh, an intergroup relationship, not simply or merely uh, an interpersonal one. And we need to understand those encounters in group and intergroup terms. And for me, that, that challenges some of the some of the assumptions that are sometimes made by uh, procedural justice theories, uh, theorists that, that, that the model is about um, how legitimacy operates in interactions that are assumed to be interpersonal rather than intergroup. So there's a challenge at work here in how we uh, interpret at a theoretical level, the dynamics of, of that interaction in, in social psychological terms. But crowds are also interesting not because they, they represent to us how police citizen encounters can operate at the level of the group rather than the level of the individual. There are also places where the normal power relations that exist between police and citizen um, can get reversed. And I think a really powerful example of that is, is just recently at Capitol Hill, that crowds are places where people who normally feel disempowered in their relationship to the police can momentarily become overwhelmingly powerful, so much so that they can challenge uh, the very state itself. So what we're seeing here is that the issues around which, for example, uh, people mobilized in uh, Capitol Hill are, are premised around ideas of legitimacy, they're premised around ideas of, 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 of perceptions of, of power and empowerment, and they're dynamic occurring uh, over time uh, through a process of interaction. So it suggests that police legitimacy itself needs to be studied in those kinds of contexts 
in order to be adequately understood. If we simply abstract it from its context, we can never really understand how those interactional and identity dynamics play really important roles in governing how the process of police legitimacy, police fairness um, work uh, over time in, in the context of those interactions. So our work on crowds, which is predominantly ethnographic in its orientation, effectively studies police citizen encounters, but we do it in the context of crowds. And when we do it in that context, what we see are processes at work that suggest identity, legitimacy, and intergroup interaction are intimately intertwined with social context. And these are all factors which appear to interrelate uh, via a social psychological process. And as a consequence, we need, we need to study these processes as such and study them in context. So this suggests it's really important and, and valuable to move beyond uh, a predominantly survey-based abstracted quantitative methodology and to start to study these interactions in context ethnographically to understand how perceptions of police legitimacy and identity change through and within um, interaction. Now, arguably, this is, this is um, not an isolated call because it, it resonates very clearly with uh, the work of Bottoms and Tankerby, who, who, who talk about the importance of exploring the dialogic nature of, of legitimacy and the dynamics between power holders and audiences, bearing in mind that in the context of the crowd, the power holder can be the citizen uh, themselves, even only momentarily. Um, but I would argue it also goes back to some of the fundamentals of, of uh, early propositions around procedural justice theory, and in particular, um, the, the notion of the teachable moment, that every interaction is a teachable moment because legitimacy itself is embedded within that interaction. And arguably, then, there's a need for an ethnographic approach um, in criminology to study issues of procedural fairness and, and police legitimacy. And also just simply to, to recognize wider calls within the social sciences, made most recently by Mick Billy, who, who argues of the value of, of looking at particular examples of how police and citizen encounters take place in context, to explore those examples in detail, to understand how these processes might work and not rely uh, merely on, on broader uh, abstracted generalizations as if our job is to inquire about these universal processes. So that's my attempt to try and introduce some of the context of, of, of today's uh, presentations. And you're gonna hear uh, now from, from three of the uh, early career researchers who've, who've been working on the project. We're gonna to talk to us firstly about, about what officers take into their encounters with the public. Given that we understand that these are interactional processes, we need not just to study the psychology of the citizen, but also the psychology of police officers to understand what they take into those encounters to shape them, to create the context through which the citizen generates their experience of police legitimacy. Uh, we're going to hear from, from uh, Leanne Savagar, who's going to talk to us about interactions in police custody uh, and to talk to us about the way in which uh, that research uh, tells us a great deal about the operation of, of the rules uh, of procedural fairness and the relationship to context. And, and lastly, from, from Arabella, who's going to talk to us about how the dynamics of procedural fairness operate uh, when policing marginalised communities. So that's enough for me uh, for, for, for now, and hopefully that helps set the context for the, the following three talks. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Cliff. Great stuff. Um, well, you've, you've already done all the introductions for me, so I shall just hand straight over uh, to, Dr. to Matthew Radburn, uh, who's a postdoctoral uh, researcher at KPAC for the first of these presentations. Matt, over to you. I wonder if you're on mute, Matt. Sorry about that. Um, can you hear me and see me now okay, Ben? Yeah, I've got you, yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so yeah, I'm Dr. Matt Radburn. I work um, in KPAC with uh, Cliff, and, Cliff and the rest of the team, really. Um, and Cliff has provided a really great overview there of our thinking 
at Keel as we started the console project, both theoretically and also the implications for this empirically too. Uh, so I'm going to try and build on this by talking briefly about the first empirical output of the Keel strand of the project. And the first thing to note is that what I'm presenting is an interview study, uh, which may seem at odds with a symposium focused on police ethnography. Uh, but the reason I'm doing that is because the data set that this study draws on was collected as part of wider ethnographic approach uh, undertaken by Leanne, who's up next. And in particular, Leanne undertook participant observational research totaling over 250 plus hours with various policing teams across several shift patterns. And as part of this wider project, Leanne undertook 22 interviews with officers uh, who were undertaking various roles, but the majority of those were being um, neighborhood and response officers. And this is the data set on which the article that I'm talking about today is based. So moving on to the rationale for this study, uh, we were interested in the role that police psychology plays in shaping encounters with the public. Uh, and of course, most of the pseudo justice theory literature, as Cliff suggested, is, is focused on public perceptions of the police. Uh, and so police perspectives and what officers actually bring into their encounters with members of the public is a fundamental but often neglected aspect of what Bobs and Tankerby refer to as the dialogic model of police public relations. So in a fairly general sense, we were, as the title of the paper suggests, we were interested in how police officers talked about their encounters with members of the public. And we were also specifically interested in police identity. So how do officers socially position themselves relative to others in their talk, both in relation to other colleagues, but also the public? And this interest relates to our argument that the group engagement model, the social psychological model that underpins procedural justice theory, depicts a fairly limited model of uh, identity process. Uh, so this uh, figure at the bottom of the screen here is adapted by, um, by a paper from Blader and Tyler, which is a seminal paper which aims to sort of test and extend the group engagement model. And here they suggest that social identity comprises three components. So the first is the cognitive component, uh, identification, which is defined as a sense of belongingness to a group. And the other two components are evaluative and relate to value judgments, people attached to their group memberships. So the first one of these is pride, which refers to evaluations of the status of an in-group relative to other groups. And the other, is respect, which refers to people's judgments of their standing and acceptance within their group. I think what this model misses in this conceptualization of social identity is that you cannot have a sense of self without a contextually defined theory of the other. So who they are is equally as important as who we are. So I see myself today as a panelist uh, but my sense of identification as a panellist is partly defined by what I'm not in this context. Uh, and in this case, that's a member of the audience. So viewed in these terms, social identity is a model of one's position within a set of social relations. And importantly, this model will change according to, to the context. So that's not to say that I believe that the group engagement models threefold conceptualization is wrong but uh, clearly these components are fundamental to an understanding of identity. But as I've argued, there's more to it than this. And I think qualitative research is well-placed to try and tease out some of this complexity. So the first thing to say before presenting some of our headline findings is a brief note on how we went about the analysis. We each, individually listened to the interviews and made notes of what we thought were theoretically relevant episodes or examples, and then transcribed these to facilitate discussion collectively as a team. And believe it or not, this actually took place in the same room because it was pre-COVID. Um, and from a series of these discussions, we developed our initial thematic structure, and then we then challenged and revised this interpretation of the data 
by re-listening to the interviews and drawing on more examples as necessary. And we went through this process iteratively uh, multiple times until we were confident that we had a thematic structure that had a good fit with the data. And what was really interesting about this approach from my perspective is that we prioritised discussion and interaction with each other when analysing the data, rather than just the sort of traditional paper and highlighter solitary coding approach or solitary coding through uh, computer programs such as NVivo. In terms of our analysis, um, our first finding was that offices definitely recognise the importance of acting in procedurally fair, fair ways um, in their interactions with the public. But interestingly, this was often described in somewhat instrumental terms as a means of preventing adverse community reactions rather than purely as a means of constructing legitimate trust-based relationships. And on the flip side of this, uh, officers also emphasise the potential negative ramifications of public perceptions of unfairness. And this was described as important because it could disempower the police and, and inhibit their, the realisation of their strategic goals. And I think what was interesting about this finding that the importance of procedural fairness was often tinged with a sense of instrumentalism within officers' talk is the extent to which these descriptions may mirror the way in which the approach is actually pitched in our research often. Um, Justice Tankerby's review and critique of procedural justice theory, for instance, um, from 2009, uh, contains a similar reflection, that there's a danger in emphasising our research how procedural fairness promotes compliance and cooperation over and above the fact that treating people in these procedurally fair ways should be an intrinsic value in and of itself. And uh, the second part to this was in line with previous research that Ben and others have conducted, internal organisational justice was a key feature of officer talk. So for example, there's often a distinction drawn between an absence of trust with senior management and the job in inverted commas, in contrast to more positive relations with their, within their immediate policing teams. We also found that the way in which our interviewees defined their policing identities was complex. Police officers talk, drew heavily on the idea that there was a singular police family which related in important ways to their sense of belonging to their force as an organisation or, or as a police officer more generally. However, at times they also define themselves in terms of their specific role or team, for example, us as response officers, but then contrasted this with other policing roles and officers, uh, so them as neighbourhood officers, for example, in ways that had implications for uh, and often actually challenged, you know, what it actually means to be a police officer. And officers also stressed that there isn't a unitary public that they had to appeal to, but that there were multiple publics or groups that they need to appeal to and therefore gain legitimacy from. And our interviewees defined these different publics by geographical location as well as class and ethnicity and um, populated by people who were depicted as either very similar or to or different from the officers themselves. So for example, our interviewees often describe their encounters with the public um, were, were far, far more frequent and problematic in areas of economic deprivation relative to more affluent neighborhoods. And these comparisons were particularly relevant for some officers who described people in these areas as very different from and alien to the stable middle-class backgrounds from which they originated, as this, this example here illustrates. And officers also described people within these different communities or publics uh, as viewing the police as either friend or foe, um, either with us or against us as soon as they arrived in a particular locality. So whilst I can't go into too much more detail uh, here, I think our analysis begins to highlight that you cannot explore police identity by reference simply to the self without also considering an officer's complex theory of who they are in a given context. 
And I think this is important theoretically um, as it goes beyond the group engagement models, conceptualization of social identity as belongingness, pride and respect. But I think it also has implications for the notion of self-legitimacy and or how confident officers feel in their own authority within the different geographical areas that they police. And in particular, it points to the idea that officers don't simply possess a global sense of their confidence in their own authority, but that these are context specific judgments which relate in important ways to how they socially position themselves relative to others in a given situation. And I think our analysis also challenged the idea that police public interactions are merely interpersonal in nature because there was an understanding among, among our interviewees of the group level nature of relations between police officers and citizens within the different geographical localities, uh, which also often contained an important historical dimension to them. I think the third aspect of our analysis I'll briefly highlight is the sheer complexity of officers' descriptions of their encounters with members of the public, um, which was immediately apparent to all of us as we discussed specific examples in our um, repeated analysis sessions. Now I'm aware that this sort of observation is to a large extent sort of self-evidence of highlighting complexity, but I also think that it's important as it speaks to the relationship between our data and theorizing. Uh, and one, and I think one of the big advantages, but also the large challenge of an ethnographic approach is the fact that it forces you to recognize the limitations of theory by embracing the complexity of real world examples. Uh, and when you do this, um, as William James, the so-called father of psychology suggested, it's difficult to avoid the conclusion that theory mutilates reality. And as I say, when we discussed our data as a team, we were at times thinking at some level, it's impossible to capture this complexity within any theoretical framework really. Um, but having said that, I think by taking an inductive approach and by not imposing our theoretical categories of understanding on the participants from the outset, we can arrive at novel theoretical insights which are built directly from the examples uh, within our data. So I'll leave you with one example that sort of bookends our analysis in the paper uh, that highlights this issue before briefly drawing some conclusions and handing over to Leanne. So this is an example of an interaction with the public given by a female response officer uh, and the slightly overpowering bubbles around it just represent some of the sort of possible codes for this example. Uh, so I'll read this out now and forgive me for my wooden performance. Um, I needed to arrest him. I trusted what he was saying to me and he said he needed to go inside the house and put the dogs away. And he went in the house, he locked the door and he did one out the back. And obviously, as you can imagine, that didn't go down very well. And I was mortified. I remember speaking to his mates who were there and I was like, seriously, he's really screwed me over. I trusted him and he let me down and I felt let down. And even his mates were like, we're really sorry, miss. I can't believe he's done that. We will try and phone him. We'll try and get him to come in and see you. Genuinely, they were gutted. And even after he afterwards, obviously it all got sorted, but he phoned me and apologized. He was like, my friends told me that you were gonna get in a lot of trouble and I'm sorry. But I didn't want to spend the night in a cell. He said, my friends said that you were sad and I was, I was sad. So I think that that's just one of the many sort of incredibly complex examples of police and interactions that, that we uh, got within the interview data. And like I said, forgive me for my wooden performance of it. And um, I'm aware I'm not going to get an acting role anytime soon. Um, so just to sort of conclude really, First of all, procedural justice mattered to officers, both internally within their organization, but externally too. Uh, through these, and through these descriptions, though, um, they often contained a hint of instrumentalism. Uh, second, there's a need to view and study social identity as a dynamic context specific model of social relations and not just a sense of belonging to, pride in, and respect within and in group. And third, we need to study the dynamics of actual 
police public interactions and not just rely on post hoc attitudes or descriptions of officers and or members of the public. And of course, in this study, we relied on descriptions of interactions between police officers and members of the public and had no real idea of how those other than the single officer themselves viewed these encounters. And so the sort of next two presentations, I think, go a step further and utilize uh, participant observational data to try and do this. Um, and so without further delay, I'll uh, pass over to Leanne. Leanne, are you ready to share your screen? Brilliant. Hello. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Leanne Sabiga Shaw. She's uh, now a lecturer in policing at Staffordshire University. I think I've got that there. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm Leanne. Oh, no. You are yeah, seeing we, the we last can... slide. <laughs> Wow, well, now you know what to expect. <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll start from the beginning for a change. Um, hi everyone, I'm Leanne. And, and I suppose as, as Matt mentioned, I was heavily involved in a lot of the work that we've talked about so far today, um, along with the team. As he said, it, much of it was a, a team ethnography that we've conducted and been involved in the analysis of. Um, and I suppose to expand upon uh, our previous work and, and many of those points that were raised by Matt, the logical next step for our research was to turn to a qualitative observational methodology and, and talk to you about that today. To begin to unpack some of the complex and dynamic interactional processes between police and citizens. And, and as Matt's mentioned, this forms part of the wider ethnographic research that I was involved in. Um, over 250 hours of observation within uh, one of the largest metropolitan police forces in the UK uh, over a two month period. And I'll be focusing specifically on those interactions that took place in police custody here. So um, 86 hours were spent specifically in police custody and a further 72 with response officers that, that kind of led to some interaction in custody. So that's where the focus will be for me. Okay, so it's, it's both for me here to expand upon some of our previous work and also to think about expanding upon other procedural justice related uh, literatures that Cliff highlighted back at the beginning. And, and I suppose considering the custody context in particular was really important for us um, and, and the possibility of procedural justice within it. Um, as police custody has been described as a qualitatively different police setting. So we wanted to really get to grips with, well, what does that look like? What do interactions look like in, in police custody where citizens are subject to a loss of liberty and experience a different kind of interaction um, that, than other police citizen interactions? And there has been a, a, a lack of procedural justice theory research that has looked at those interactions with people who have been uh, non-compliant with the law, those who have been arrested as opposed to the general population and, and considering kind of the, the longitudinal aspects of policing beyond an initial contact with a police officer um, and, and that in-between phase that custody represents between uh, the initial interaction and, and the prison literature that we do see. Um, what happens in that middle bit there? And, and surely, I think, as, as Cliff kind of alluded to at the beginning, that those group, that population should be of as much, if not more, interest to us in relation to procedural justice theory, um, in understanding how the fairness or the justice appears in those interactions with people who have uh, been non-compliant uh, or, or have broken the law. So I'll talk about the ethnographic interviews and observations that, that kind of came out of the research and some of our analyses that have flown from that. This is um, a, a manuscript, manuscript in preparation with the um, 
publishers. So fingers crossed that that all goes smoothly from now. And, and so I'm going to talk to you about some of the conclusions that we've drawn from, from the data around police custody, which initially, uh, I suppose, highlight the major complexity to understanding procedural justice and police citizen interactions in this context. One of the most notable points to make about the ethnography was the importance and relevance of context in any attempt to understand how procedural justice might operate. So fairness was framed in the context or background in which interactions took place. And there were kind of three, three different areas that you'll see there on the slides that, that uh, really came out of the data. But firstly, that those interactions taking place in custody weren't one-off individual encounters simply taking place between an officer and a member of the public at any one point in time, seems to make sense. By the time an interaction is taking place in custody, there has usually been a preceding interaction that has led to the arrest of an individual presenting in custody. And that was always the case for our observations. And, and it might sound simple and um, minor but it's actually an important point to make as procedural justice theory literatures have tended to overlook this longitudinal uh, or sequential nature of interactions between the police and those citizens who have already indicated a lack of compliance with the law that's led to their arrest and, and entry into custody and those prior interactions between the citizen and arresting officer or officers also often informed or influenced the nature of an interaction with custody officers and staff too. So, so that background information is important to understand the here and now, okay, what's going on in the, in the interaction uh, that's taking place in custody. And so the second point then is, is around, and, and again, quite obvious, now you mention it, uh, that police is in interactions in custody and was the case in other contexts that I observed as well. They weren't simply between two people, between an officer and a citizen, uh, that actually they were um, between various and multiple people in a circumstance or, or a context. And, and I suppose the, the um, dyadic relationship or interaction between a police and citizen is how we very often see it conceptualized in procedural justice theory. Uh, beforehand, whereas now we're starting to develop this uh, importance and to explore the idea that actually there's lots of people involved in some of these interactions. Um, in custody, you've got arresting officers, accompanying officers, custody sergeants, other custody staff, nurses, escort officers, uh, and, and other people all in, in that context who have the opportunity and, and get involved in some way in an interaction. And that it's more complex than a simple dyadic relationship or interaction between officer and citizen. So again, that, that was really obvious, but really important to understanding the framing of procedural justice in an interaction. And thirdly, that those interactions that had taken place sequentially with multiple actors were now being, were now taking place in a, a somewhat different legal context. Um, although obviously general legislation and policy guiding police work still applies very much in, in the custody context, there are other pieces of legislation that, that kind of take the forefront. The Police and Criminal Evidence Act in particular largely guides the work of officers and introduces paradifferentials that highlight the role of the custody sergeant, um, not constable, and, and the, the powers and procedures necessitated by that sergeant in the custody context and, and PACE places a responsibility upon those custody sergeants to authorise detention and ensure that it is legal and, and necessary. So it's that legislative context that also has an impact upon what's going on in, in these interactions. And architecturally, even the, the, the custody officer even sits uh, at a height advantage to the arresting officer and citizen. So even architecturally, there's, there's a different uh, kind of dynamic going on. Um, albeit for safety reasons, this appeared to 
serve as a physical separation between those involved in the interactions and, and kind of informed the power that custody sergeants often talked about having um, over the situation and over uh, other people involved in that interaction. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a minute. But this relevant legislation frames the, the legal legitimacy of the interaction that takes place in custody. And it is key to understanding what is legitimate in this context. So again, it's something that, that really does matter and, and plays a key role in understanding what does fairness look like and how does it operate in this context. So ultimately in custody and in other contexts, but here I'm focusing specifically on police custody, interactions are not ahistorical, but they are the direct result of prior interactions with other officers in a different location. And when citizens arrive at custody, their interactions are also underpinned by a, a credible suspicion that they have broken the law. Within an architectural and legal framework that emphasizes the role of the custody sergeant um, and, and somewhat changes the focus and the responsibilities and accountability and complexity of the interactions that take place within it. The second key theme, theme from our analysis relates to the primary function of risk assessment and categorization in informing interactions taking place in custody. And this ties in closely to some of the legislative background that I've already outlined, uh, for example, relating to PACE that highlights the procedures that must be undertaken by custody sergeants in their work detaining individuals in custody. And risk assessment was a key element of the procedure between custody staff and citizens. And even before any formal risk assessment procedure, more nuanced information presented uh, notions of risk and, uh, and ideas of risk to the custody officer. So, for example, the form of handcuffing of a citizen upon their arrival to the custody uh, suite. Sorry. Uh, was used as a means to begin to understand the level of risk that had been formerly associated with the citizen by the arresting officer. So citizens handcuffed to the front of the body had greater freedom, flexibility and comfort in relation to their physical restraint, whereas those handcuffed to the rear of the body were more restrained in the actions that they were able to perform. Yeah. And with that greater restraint indicates um, kind of some of the, the trust and the, the sense of risk that's already been afforded to that citizen by the arresting officer. Okay, so if I cuff you to the front with more freedom to access objects, for example, I am presenting an element of trust that you will not use that freedom to cause harm or distress or commit further offences. So it, this, this risk categorization applied at, at that earlier stage, but was taken into the custody context through this nuanced information. But more formally, a risk assessment took place using information and databases available to the custody staff. And one of those was uh, the warning markers associated with an individual. So things like having historical incidents of, of violence or being known to have mental ill health. And the interactions between citizen and custody staff were not entirely neutral in that sense. They were kind of guided by some of this risk categorization that was informed by those prior interactions. Sometimes that information was long-term historical and, and perhaps a little bit outdated, but, but still guided those interactions and, and was brought up either by the arresting officer or the custody officer uh, to, to guide that risk categorization process. And this was combined with a more formal assessment of the physical, medical and mental health needs of the individual that guided the level of observation of, of individuals in the custody cells. So those who admitted to or had previous warning markers for mental health concerns, for example, uh, such as suicidal thoughts or, or tendencies, were assigned a higher risk status than others and were subsequently subject to an enhanced level of observation than others. And what this suggests is that this process of categorization legitimizes different pathways of interaction 
that follow that initial risk assessment procedure. It is therefore key to those subsequent interactions and the type of information guiding them. And, and so the, the risk categorization process and, and the role of custody staff as holders of power in that context is key to understanding those subsequent interactions and, and how they look and take place. Building on those two previous points, um, one of the recurring influential factors was a notion of power within interactions. That power differentials existed both between officers, so custody officer and, and for example, the response officer who brought in um, the detained citizen, as well as between the police and citizen. Okay, so we've got a lot of these um, identity processes that are going on at different levels. Emphasize the complexity yet again. So, for example, the custody sergeant had the power to refuse detention of a citizen despite the work and suggestions of detention made by the arresting officer. They had the power to do that. And the custody officer also had, had, has power to guide subsequent interactions between the citizen and custody staff through that risk assessment process that I just talked to you about. And one of the ways that this risk categorization process played out in interactions was also in the level of autonomy, the custody officer subsequently appeared to offer the, the, the citizen or uh, the detainee. So for those who remained compliant in custody and those who had been assigned a low level of risk, they were given additional privileges, um, being able to retrieve phone numbers from their phones rather than having an officer doing that. Um, putting their own belongings on, on the custody desk rather than having an officer doing that. Um, and, and as such, custody officers um, depicted a, a notion of trust and an associated respect in that interaction that I trust you to be able to do that. Um, I'm trusting you to put those items on the desk. Um, and they also indicated that they were respected enough not to endanger others with the gifted independence itself affording a level of dignity to the detainee. So all of these notions of, of the um, principles of procedural justice kind of tied in really closely together and were really closely interlinked. So in a sense, it, it was presented as a gift from the powerful to the subordinated, um, the, that autonomy could be offered to those who were compliant and low risk. Um, but, but were also acted, uh, th those acts also acted as tools of instrumental punishment where cooperation was problematic or not achieved. Um, they, they were reminded, citizens were reminded of, the, of, of that power differential. If, if you carry on talking in that way, in that telephone call to your family member, I will put you back in your cell. I will take away that autonomy. I will take away that privilege that you've been gifted because of your low risk or your compliance. And similarly, where citizens show physical aggression or refuse to cooperate in the first place, they were often just taken directly to a cell and any opportunities for exercising trust, respect, voice were entirely removed. There's no opportunity for that. You're, you're just gonna be taken to your cell. And, and this is legal and legality was key to custody officers in the way that they talked about their notion of legitimacy. Um, and and in, in appeared paramount in comparison to their ideas of fairness or procedural justice. So, so the legal context again really matters too. And, and just very quickly to pick up on this idea of voice here as well, that actually sometimes um, voice meant declaring offending where it was being recorded, so having an opportunity to voice sometimes meant talking about your offending that was being recorded uh, from the perspective of the citizen. And so was often denied by custody officers as a means of protecting the integrity of the legal process and reinforcing the right to silence for the citizen, rather than actually offering voice as a means of procedural justice or fairness. It might have been this or, or simply a disinterest in the actions of the citizen, but it was indeed often described in a way that was beneficial to the citizen. I'm not part of the investigation team, but remember you're being recorded and, and this is a legal process. Um, it's for your benefit actually not to. 
And that kind of brings us full circle, that the context guides the extent to which procedurally just treatment is made possible and how that might play out in police and interactions. So traditionally, what we see is procedural justice theory conceptualized in this way, with interactions of trust, respect, neutrality and voice leading to compliance. However, our observations and interviews suggested that this wasn't the full story, that actually what we saw was a little more like this, that whilst elements of procedural justice were there and did seem to feature to some extent in attempts to or experiences of compliance. The opposite route was also apparent in custody that those categorised as low risk and cooperating with police directives appear to be offered greater opportunities for fair policing in terms of trust, dignity and respect. So fair treatment was not merely used as a means of agendering compliance, but rather was a gift that flowed from existing compliance and cooperation. And procedural fairness was offered by custody staff who exist as powerful in the custody context to those who demonstrated compliance in the first place. But where a lack of cooperation was encountered, it was often not any attempt to apply procedural justice theory principles to interactions in order to achieve compliance, but the removal of any possibility of doing that. For example, putting a citizen in a cell to cool down. And, and actually it was legislation it makes this possible, it allows this to happen and ensures during times of accountability that custody staff have a legal basis for their actions, um, that, that what they do is and, and was used to, to legitimise the use of coercion in order to achieve compliance, that they have that legal backing. Um, and, and this is something that needs further explora exploration in, in future research and in other policing contexts, but was one of the particularly important and interesting findings to come from our research. So our conclusions centre around the notion that procedural justice is an extremely complex concept, and it's more than simply a mechanistic route to compliance, whereby opportunities for voice, um, depictions of trust or trustworthy motives, interactions of dignity and respect all lead to compliance. Actually, there's a lot going on in those police citizen interactions in the custody context that interferes with all of that. Okay, and that there's lots more that I could talk to you about, but I will pass on to Arabella and I will stop talking now. Thank you very much, Leanne. Uh, before I hand over to Arabella, just to remind people uh, to use the Q&A function um, as you think of questions. If you put the questions in there, they're more likely to get asked at the end because I'll go through them more or less in order they come up. Um, our, our final speaker uh, is Dr. Arabella Kiprianides, um, who is a, a postdoctoral research fellow at the IGCP and at KPAC. So we've got John's appointment. Over to you, Arabella. Can, can you see that okay, Ben? Yeah, got that. Great. All right. Well, hi, everybody, and thank you, Ben, for the introduction. I am going to talk you through the final empirical paper of the day. Um, and in this paper, we explored the relevance of procedural justice theory for understanding the relationship between police and marginalized groups and individuals. Specifically, I'm going to be talking to you about the relationship between police and homeless people in London. So I just wanted to start uh, talking to you a bit about policing the homeless. So homeless people are marginalized in many ways. They experience personal and economic hardship, and they often endure stigma and structural discrimination because of their housing status and the forms of deep social exclusion that interact with it. Um, things like histories of institutional care, substance misuse, and participation in street culture activities. Recent developments in the policing of the homeless complicate the narrative of homelessness policing as something that's uniformly hostile, punitive and exclusionary, and instead reveal a pattern of simultaneous punitive and less punitive approaches that promote joint police services interventions. So multi-agency initiatives bringing together a range of stakeholders to police homeless people are now very common. This includes police outreach workers, homelessness organizations, local councils and others who all sort of, sort of work together to tackle issues related to homelessness, such as begging or rough sleeping, 
um, criminal activities and antisocial behavior. And I think police encounters with this population, therefore, need to be studied as a dynamic process embedded in context. Um, so far in the literature, there's been a tendency to overlook questions of context and the agency of police officers and actors, as well as the resist resistive capacities of their homeless targets. Um, the conclusion being that there is much work to be done in analyzing how the policing of homelessness actually unfolds on the streets and what its consequences are. So to this end, um, in this paper, we attempt to capture the nature of policing homeless populations in one particular context, and that is a specific London borough. So an enormous amount of research has provided support for core aspects of procedural justice theory, even as debate around some issues persists. Despite the central place of group membership and self-categorization in procedural justice theory, the extant literature has several significant and arguably limiting characteristics. We've heard quite a lot about that today, so I won't reiterate this um, in any depth, except to say that at the threshold, these limiting characteristics concern the types of populations covered in much procedural justice theory research, which has focused either on the general public or on specific groups um, with a strong interest in their own group versus the police. And the second point is that the encounter that lies at the heart of procedural justice theory, um, at least as conceptualized within criminology, has generally been construed as a one-off, a historical event involving a single individual and a single or small group of police officers. So to help address some of these limitations, um, today, I'm going to be presenting a study of the relationship between police and a group largely absent from procedural justice theory research, and that is people living on the streets. So we consider here a population that's not only highly marginalized, but it also might be considered fundamentally disconnected from society. Our central concern is how the core sort of pathways of procedural justice theory, so from encounters with police, to trust, legitimacy, and onto compliance, how these pathways might play out within a group that's so far outside the social mainstream. In a sense, therefore, in our work, we're sort of looking for a limit case for procedural justice theory, at least in respect to its social identity and group dynamic elements. So moving on to what we actually did. So we utilized ethnographic methodologies that entailed the focus, of course, on the street population. Um, this was those that had a history of homelessness, substance use disorder, sex work, and or perhaps imprisonment, who were residing on the streets of an inner London borough. We selected this population and the research site in conjunction with our partner police force, that was the Metropolitan Police Service, um, because it reflects an isolated community with whom relations are problematic and policing issues are regularly linked with conflict and accusations of illegitimacy. So to achieve the project objectives, I embedded myself with a charity um, that delivers street outreach to support homeless people in the area. With the police street population engagement team and with the homeless community itself. So I spent six months, approximately 180 hours in the field between May and October 2019. Um, and I engaged in three key ethnographic research activities. So I shadowed multi-agency hotspot patrols in the area organized by the police. I shadowed charity outreach patrols in the area organized by the charity. And I also spent time with the street population as they went about their everyday lives. And I got to witness firsthand some of the lived experience of this particular setting. So the ethnographic methodology we undertook, which employed multiple approaches to qualitative data collection, generated a very large data corpus. It was made up of situated interactional and longitudinal data um, that can be split into three primary orders of data. So we had verbal data, um, basically talk, walking interviews and in-depth conversations were conducted with the authorities and with members of the street population. Regarding their routine activities, their interactions with each other, procedural justice, and perceptions of their personal and social identities. 
Then we had visual data, so observational and behavioral data, observation of the everyday life of this borough's street population, and observation of police and charity routine activity while on the street patrols, um, which included uh, street police briefings, direct observations of police street population encounters, and also directed conversations within those observations with all the parties involved. And finally, we also provided our street population participants with disposable cameras, as well as notebooks and pens to record their day to day experiences in the form of photographs and diary entries. Um, much like Matt described in detail in his talk, our team employed a form of collective thematic analysis to analyze this very large data corpus. This entailed collectively reflecting on the various types of data, identifying recurring or theoretically relevant issues within it, and finally collectively developing a coherent thematic structure that captured the underlying data. So the first part of our analysis that I'll provide you as a snapshot for describes three dimensions that shape and characterize homeless people's relationship with the police. And this is the, the first dimension. So I think central to understanding our research context was the observation that homeless people exist in a context of structural disempowerment. Um, so here's what one of our participants said that captures this really well. It's terrible around here. It's so demoralizing. It's one hit after another. It breaks my heart. I feel worthless. I am scared 24 hours a day of everything. That's the true understanding of how it is on the streets from scoring to getting robbed to robbing people. It's the way life is on the streets. So I think indeed the most striking feature of our observational data was this harsh psychological and material reality faced by our homeless participants and the many practical challenges that they faced um, to do with finding shelter, getting money and acquiring drugs. And uh, participants also, also describe themselves as being at the bottom of society with the rest of society sort of looking down on them. Within this context, there were different stakeholders who governed and worked with homeless people and the interplay between them formed a second dimension to homeless people's relationship with the police. So police and non-police actors negotiated how they exercised power and authority over the street population. And this struggle refracted the application of police power such that the agenda for the patrols was contingent on who was actually present during those patrols. So when charity workers were present alongside the police, there was a relatively supportive, caring approach um, to interactions that focused on enabling people to get away from their street-based lifestyle. By contrast, when police were working alone and I was present at the patrols, they described how they were there to enforce the law. And every observation where the charity was not present focused on arresting wanted members of the street population and giving out warnings for begging as well as community protection notices. So this is what um, one police officer told me. He said, it's like good cop, bad cop. With the charity, we're good cop. Without them, we're bad cop. We hold back when the charity is present so that we don't interfere with their role. So the third dimension um, is about dynamic microsociological interactions. Members of the street population often talk to me about their relationship with the police using the narrative of playing the game, a kind of competition being played by two teams. On the one side were the police, sometimes portrayed as the predatory cats, and on the other were the street population, sometimes described as the devious but crafty mice. In this game, the street population knew the rules very well, and they described several tricks up their sleeves um, that allowed them to do what they wanted or needed to do in order to survive, regardless of what the police did. The street population additionally learned the police's shift patterns and acted dynamically to avoid getting caught, for example, by hiding their begging cups um, at times where they expected the police to come on duty. And they were also very well informed about police practices and jurisdictions. So for example, during one patrol that I shadowed, it was clear that the street population present knew that the police officers on duty avoided making arrests outside of their borough jurisdiction because doing so complicated police processes. And I've actually included one of my field notes on the slide because I think um, 
this captures what I'm talking about really well. So a female rough sleeper who spotted the team while she was begging on a road within one borough, stood up from where she was sitting and crossed the road into the neighborhood borough, smiled at the police officer and set up her begging spot there. It was apparent that she understood the rules governing the boundaries of police authority and adapted accordingly. Following this observation, the police officer on duty explained to me, they know the boroughs have a very fine line. They know we won't touch them there because that's a different borough. They are clever. They know how to run away from us. They know where they are safe. And I think that this, this observation reveals that the power dynamics between the police and the homeless can change and even be reversed by playing the so-called game well. So after having described the three dimensions important for understanding encounters between the police and members of the street population, the second part of our analysis considers what this relationship and the ways it plays out may mean for procedural justice theory. And the first point is about procedural injustice in encounters with the police. We found very little to suggest that procedural fairness had any downstream implications. It didn't appear to lead to greater police legitimacy. It didn't seem to affect homeless people's identification with society. And in particular, it did not seem to affect their behavior. Rather, what we found was that it was distributive justice and instrumental outcomes that seemed to matter most um, because it's these that affected homeless people's very survival potential. And these naturally for them took precedence. So for example, one respondent talked to me about the disproportionate treatment he received from the police compared to other members of the street population who had been given permission to sell the big issue magazine. Um, for any non-UK attendees today, the big issue is a social business that offers homeless people the opportunity to earn a legitimate earning by selling the big issue magazine. Well, he said, they're picking on us, but they're not picking on big issue sellers. And that upsets me because he's wearing that red jacket. It's a license to stand there and make money. I'm constantly moved on by the police and that really slows down how much I can earn, but I'm not doing anything different to the big issue lads. The second point of our analysis relates to legitimacy and in particular history and context. So for the street population, perceptions of the police um, actually seem to be the byproduct of other social processes that have very little to do with contemporary police activity. That this seems to be so among this particular group of people, many of whom interacted with the police on a daily basis is actually striking, I think. Um, so it was their social structural position and the temporal and spatial context within which interactions took place, coupled with their history of involvement with the police that informed their attitudes to any one interaction. And here's a quote that captures how the geographical context in particular shaped how homeless peoples uh, viewed their interactions with the police. If the police tell me to move while I'm in the station begging, he said, I'll move. I won't kick off. But if I'm here in the park doing nothing wrong, smoking some spice and lying down, chatting to my friends, then I'll kick off because that's just bullying. Same goes for when I'm asleep at night. That's my own time. I don't want anyone bothering me. I'm not bothering anybody. And moving on to the third and final point um, that has to do with behavioral outcomes that outlines the complexity of compliance in this context. So procedural justice didn't seem to motivate compliance. Indeed, our data suggested that the street population was never in a, in a technical sense going to self-regulate in the way envisaged by any mechanistic reading of procedural justice theory, where procedural fairness motivates compliance based on these internalized norms and values. The homeless people can't do that. They can't do that because they would starve. Although the, the fear of the consequences for breaking more serious laws were considered by the street population, as were the moral limits associated with more serious crimes, the benefits associated with non-compliance in relation to more minor offenses outweighed the potential costs, which in this particular context is ultimately starvation. So in that situation, it seemed to our participants that non-compliance was the rational choice. Here's what um, one of them said to me. That happens every day with the old bill. There he is. Oh, there he is again. You've just got to be polite and get up and go. If they left you alone for a couple of hours, I would make my money and get out of their way. But no, they have to follow you and about and keep moving you on. 
So I think the take home message really um, from our paper is that economic or structural reality trumps all. In extremis, outcome clearly matters more than process. Our ethnographic study of the interactions between the police and homeless people in one London borough has shown that police in the street population is unsurprisingly complex and that procedural justice theory as it's often interpreted, does not capture the reality of police street population relationships. So we first highlighted the three dimensions that underlie homeless people's relationships with the police. We had a structural context of extreme disempowerment. We had the relations between power holders, and we had the dynamic relationship between the police and the street population explicated through the narrative of the game of cat and mouse. We then explored the ways in which our data directly confronted three central aspects of procedural justice theory, the experience of injustice, police legitimacy and compliance among this particularly marginalized group. And the nature of interactions within this context and the extreme marginality of the street population altered the weight placed on fairness perceptions and the extent to which police activity um, could affect legitimacy and compliance. What, this, what all this sort of points to is that there's much more that we need to consider if we're going to understand police public interactions in this type of context. And I'd like to conclude this presentation by briefly sketching out how the findings presented here might contribute to this endeavor. So we expose the stereotypical procedural justice encounter to more detailed empirical scrutiny than has often been the case in the literature. I think that our first contribution is a focus on a population that's not only highly marginalized, but also might be considered fundamentally disconnected from society and therefore the police. We therefore provide evidence of a boundary condition for, for the procedural justice effect rather than this confirmation of the theory itself. Among members of the street population, the core pathways um, envisaged in the procedural justice theory process between procedural justice, group identification, legitimacy and compliance just appear to be moderated almost out of existence by the structural context in which homeless people find themselves. Our second contribution was our use of qualitative research techniques to explore police homeless people contact as a process. The social, historical, geographic context within which that process occurred shaped homeless people's interactions with the police. And our third contribution was to explore the many additional elements that shaped police public interaction in this context. I'll, I'll leave that there. I've got about, about 30 seconds left. So I just wanted to end the, this presentation by reading out um, a poem written by one of our participants. Life on the streets is like playing a game. Only trouble is nobody's rules are the same. Everyone's after the same piece of cake. If you get to eat, depends on the decisions you make. Play the game well and you'll have a good day. Make the wrong move could get you to pay. Be alert and stay on your toes. What could happen? God only knows. Keep your home and a roof over your head. Life out here, you could end up dead. No one's immune. It can happen to us all. Even the mighty have been known to fall. So there's a few lines that somehow rhymes to bid you a very good day. Play a good game and you will never have to pay. Thank you, everybody, for, for your attention. Great, thanks, Arabella. Um, that that poem actually said much better than I might have done. Some of the things that that I wanted to say now, actually. So, so um, uh, the the group, I guess, has asked me to give um, a few thoughts on what's been said before opening up to questions. Um, and I'm going to try to take not to take too long to do so. So we've got time for the Q and A. And Arabella is empowered to to tell me to shut up if I'm going on um, too long because she's the host on this meeting. Um, I've got two sets of comments. The first set um, apply mainly to what Cliff was saying at the beginning, what Arabella has been talking about just now. And the second set more to what Matt and Leanne were saying in, in the middle of the four presentations. And I think the first thing to say, um, and this is really important, um, and I'll come back to this at the end, um, is that procedural justice theory so far has been primarily been a theory of subjective experiences and perceptions. So what's, what's at stake in procedural justice theory as we have thought about it up until now um, has precisely been what people think about a specific process or procedure or in a general sense, more general sense, what they think about policing, how they think policing operates. Um, it's about people's subjective experiences. So the extent that we're, we're suggesting introducing um, 
for example, I think most importantly, um, the perspective of the power holder, the perspective of the police officer into the theory, in some respects, actually is, is a really, really radical change. And as I say, I'll come back to that in the second part of my comments. So firstly, I want to talk about um, the implications of what we've just heard for procedural justice theory as it's currently construed, at least within criminology. And I think that is an important distinction. We're, we're talking about how procedural justice theory has been used within criminology, it is used in different ways in other disciplines. And I think there are two really important aspects or elements of the work we've been hearing about, um, which speak to key elements of that theory, which and Arabella has already rehearsed some of this really, um, and which have been forgotten in the criminological theory. First of which is, is that perceived justice theory won't, perceived justice rather, won't work for everyone. That's always been very clear um, in the literature um, that pursuit justice doesn't always lead to legitimacy and legitimacy doesn't always lead to compliance, but it kind of gets lost in lots of the discussions we have around this issue. And people think that, for example, if, if you judge the police to be procedurally fair, then you're almost by definition less likely to commit crime or whatever it is. But that's never um, been the case. Um, I think one of the reasons why that has come to be, people have come to think that about pursuit justice theory is actually be, because the weight of empirical evidence suggests that you do find these pathways from pursuit justice through to compliance and cooperation in a large majority of samples where research is being conducted. Um, but I think, again, the key point here is that those samples have missed out the most marginalized groups with whom the police have most contact and for whom these, these issues are most salient and most important. Um, and if when you're looking at the populations such as those that Arabella was talking about, um, it's probably not surprising, I think, that when we're thinking about compliance, the law instrumental, instrumental concerns predominate. And you'd expect that to be repeated across lots of different uh, highly marginalized groups as well. And of course, this is for structural and basically economic reasons. And I think that's a really big gap in the literature. Um, we need to pay much more attention to the social and economic situation of a regular customers of policing, let me put it that way. Um, Pursuit of Justice Theory is also um, always stressed um, that some people are going to be, uh, quote unquote, relatively um, immune um, from Pursuit of Justice effects because they feel they don't fare, or because they don't feel they share a group relationship with the police. That's what the group value model of Pursuit of Justice said. Um, but I think that, again, has also been lost in much of the literature. Again, because a lot of the empirical evidence has pointed in the other direction, but also, as, as Matt and others have said, because not enough attention hasn't been paid to the group dynamic aspects of pursuit justice theory, there hasn't been really a recognition, recognition that there might be people and circumstances like that out there. I think the, the survey-based uh, thrust of much of the uh, literature um, uh, is one reason for that. What was really interesting for me is how all this plays out in the ground. So how what we've been hearing about plays out um, in the inter actual interactions that people have with the police, what they hear about police having with, with others in their communities. Um, so it's fairly clear to me um, that in a society such as the UK, at least, large numbers of people, a large majority of people can at least potentially feel a, a sense of shared identity with the police. Um, that is not a purely emergent property of contextual interaction. I think that's what we mean when we talk about the symbolic power of policing, where people like Ian Lode or Robert Reiner have talked about uh, the fact that the extent to which police serve as a condensation symbol um, that, that, that express a wide set of political, social, economic, cultural concerns to people, which people feel a sense of affiliation to. But it's equally clear, as we've been hearing, that when they go into actual interactions with police officers, people may not feel such a sense of shared group membership. They may not feel that police represent something that's important to people like them for all the reasons we've been hearing. And of course, for some people and some groups, that antagonistic relationship, if it is an antagonistic relationship, is fixed in the other direction. So the police definitively represent an outgroup to fairly significant numbers of people in our society and, 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 and it's fixed in that sense as well. But I want to know about what put, what's put, what puts people in these different positions. Um, so when is it situational, as it is in the, in the case of football crowds that Cliff was talking about? When is it social or group related, um, as in the case of the relationship between the police and some black communities in the UK, for example? When is it structural, as is the case for people experiencing homelessness? What are the roles, what are the importance and relevance of the roles that people are playing within the criminal justice system, whether they're suspect, whether they're a victim, whether they're a witness? And of course, most, perhaps most importantly, how do all these factors interact with one another at the level of individual experience as people are experiencing police activity that leads into some of the kind of processes that we've been hearing about? And I think the last thing I want to say in my first set of comments, as it were, um, um, 
it concerns the potential inclusionary aspects of procedural justice, if I can put it like that. Um, so we know from a wide range of literatures, actually, um, the unfair police uh, treatment at the hands of police officers and other security actors, indeed, um, does exclude people, does push them out, kind of uh, emotionally, uh, in an effective sense, and, and in a material sense as well. Um, but I want to know at what point do the predictions of, of the group value model, where procedural justice theory is less important to people um, who don't feel a sense of shared group membership with the police, um, what point do those predictions merge and replace by, if I can characterize this, and I, I think what Matt was saying was really important, but, but to use this language, um, um, uh, replaced by predictions from the group engagement model, such that the experience of procedural justice is valued because it, sends, it creates and strengthens a sense of belonging and inclusion. We know that's the way that people respond or can respond to fair policing. We also know it's definitely the way that people can, re people can respond to unfair policing. Unfair policing excludes, it pushes out, it marginalises. Um, so when does procedural justice stop becoming nice to have? because who doesn't want to be treated fairly um, with dignity and respect and start generating positive outcomes for the individuals concerned? And how do we conceptualize, engage those outcomes? And how do they relate back to some of these other processes about what people are bringing into these interactions in the first place? Um, the second set of comments I had just very briefly um, relate to, in a sense, some of the bigger issues um, we've been hearing about, which I think I, I would sum up is asking the question of how we can position procedural justice theory um, in a more expansive theory of police community relations that does some of the things that presentations we've just been talking about, I, can't, I think want it to do. Um, I think to provide a partial list of things that that kind of theory would need to do, um, just three, there, there are many others, I'm sure many people on this call could think of, of better reasons than I. Um, we need to understand how and why officers make the categorizations we, they do. And Matt and Leanne, touched upon this, I think we would need to do much more, much more work to understand this. I think a key distinction here might be between police culture, broadly defined, and what you could call, again, structure. So is it specific police cultures that divine deservingness, define deservingness, say which people are deserving of procedural justice and which people are not? Or is it the structural relationship between the police officer as a law enforcer and, let's say, the suspect as a lawbreaker, how are police officers, what are the factors disposing police officers to treat people differentially across these and other kinds of distinctions? Second thing I think that theory would need to do um, would be to integrate procedural justice theory much better into theories of race, ethnicity, and I would say particularly class, actually. So there's been a fair amount of research within the procedural justice paradigm in the context of race, most of it from the US, and that research um, tends to suggest, for example, relatively a little variation in the key, key procedural justice pathways from procedural justice to legitimacy to cooperation and compliance across dif different racial and ethnic groups, when that means there isn't really a race effect in procedural justice. Um, which, among other things, I think says something quite interesting about what you might call the aspirational aspects of the theory. So people across the racial divides um, in, in US society want to feel included, we want to feel that they have a stake in society, and indeed they want to feel they have a sense of ownership over the police. And this makes most people from most groups attuned to procedural justice because that's really important in kind of determining or at least affecting those kinds of relationships. But how does this play out in relation to class and particularly the kind of extreme marginalization the class system has produced for Arabella's respondents? And again, which you would expect to find replicated in other, other contexts as well. I think we know very little about these kinds of questions and much more work is to be needed. And finally, although the third thing I think this more expansive theory would need to do, I think, uh, and, and Leanne touched upon this in some depth, and I think this is really important, um, we need to think much more clearly about how the law, as the law, if you like, affects the kinds of inter interactions we're interested in. Um, so what we rightly always stress, you know, the, the, the discretion of police officers in general in, in how and when they enforce the law and the extent to which they're otherwise governed by it, clearly, on multiple subjective and objective bases, they're often doing things because it's the law. So this removes much of their agency, actually, and makes the law a very powerful third actor in the process of being here. But, and of course, it makes the people enacting the laws very powerful actors in the processes we've been talking about. And some of the laws that have been framed around homelessness and the way the police are having to enforce their laws, I think might be a really good example of that. Anyway, I, I could go on, there's lots and lots of things this more expansive theory um, would need to do. But I think to go back to the beginning and, and just to close here, 
I wonder if what we're really talking about here is not, not an expansion or an integration of procedural justice theory, um, but really something altogether altogether new. I'm not sure a theory of justice perceptions can cope with everything that I just said and everything we've just been hearing about, or even really that it needs to. Rather, what we're really talking about is, is conjoining, in some sense, procedural justice theory with other theories. Just to give an example, from a criminological perspective, when we're thinking about people's compliance behavior or their law-breaking behavior. Um, I've fought for a long while, and, I, and I'm sure other people have as well, is what we need to do is integrate procedural justice theory much better with other theories of compliance. So not just deterrence theory, which is always the significant other of procedural justice theory, but perhaps social learning theory or situational, th situational action theory, theories that give more expansive understandings or offer more expansive understandings um, of why people comply with or why people break laws than, than their relationship with the, with the police and other institutional actors. So I think we're not really in, in the realms of, of expanding or, or, or changing procedural justice theory into something that it doesn't need to be changed into. We need to think much clearly about how to articulate it with other theoretical approaches and paradigms. So, so that's, I'm going to finish there because that's me abusing my position as chair for far too long. Um, there's been some really good questions coming in on the, um, the Q&A, um, some of which have been answered um, as we're going through, but some haven't. So if I could ask all the panellists to turn their cameras back on, please. We've got about 25 minutes. We'll see how it goes. So the first question, I think some have been answered already. So the first question I've got is unanswered is, is from Amy. And she said, it's worth reading out because I think it's a really good question. I'll read it out for the sake of the recording as well. Um, and she says, my understanding uh, was that a key question in PJ, a key question PJT raises is whether police should be recruited or, and promoted against a criteria of character and competence. I read it is important to render explicit the normative and ethical foundations underpinning perceived justice theory approaches um, simply as behavioral tactics or social skills to secure compliance with the law. So should good police officers not simply perform fairness, but be really required to internalize the values that underpin legitimate policing? I think mean, that's a really good question. Who wants to kick us off on that one? I don't mind just starting a little bit um, in response to that, Amy. My initial thoughts are some of the conversations that we've had with police forces around training fairness and the importance, coming back to the idea of the importance of context, that, that what is fairness? How do you train procedural justice when fairness looks so different in different contexts with different groups of people? Um, so, so I think very much, yes, that it makes more sense to kind of internalize these notions of fairness, um, to get experience of what fairness looks like or an understanding of what fairness, fairness looks like in those different contexts with different groups of people um, before, you can actually implement. Um, I think the point is really how do you train procedural fairness um, when when we actually are really questioning what 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 does that mean? And and it's so complex. We spent this long talking about it now, and I'm sure we could spend even longer. Um, and, and, and so the idea of kind of training fairness is is perhaps a little inadequate. It's a, a lot more complex than that. Just, just to follow on that point, a very good contribution there, Leanne, it, just to build on that point by saying one of the things that we want to try to do now is to work with West Midlands Police to, to try and think about scenario-based learning for procedural fairness so that officers can think about the craft of constructing fairness and legitimacy within a range of different contexts. So moving away from this idea that you just need to do these four things to make it fair to recognise that as you're in one context, you need to think of legitimacy as a process through which you can work to um, apply certain uh, ways of, of policing to construct legitimacy. Great stuff, thanks both. Uh, the next question is in some sense is the, the flip side of the first one. And this is from, from Robert. Um, in the models, to what extent are malicious agents accounted for? I organized actors who start the interaction with enforcement from an antagonistic or, aggr or an aggressive position. Cliff. Oh, Matt as well. Who wants to go first? Matt, I, you go. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll jump in. Um, yeah, I, I suppose this this touches on, on one of the points that myself and, and Cliff raised, really. Um, that the sort of a lot of the research is obviously um, quantitative survey based and essentially sort of looks at 
post hoc evaluations of interactions um, rather than a sort of exploration of the dynamics within interactions in, in a way that sort of uh, I think Leanne and um, Arabella's presentations in particular sort of highlight. So I think this sort of question highlights the key challenge really in terms of exploring these sort of dynamics within interactions and, and how the powerful act within them because I think like you said Ben um, you know sort of a, a key aspect of the theory that well at least the empirical research I suppose um, is that it's focused on public perceptions of powerful rather than you know sort of the, the flip side of that and um, you know exploring uh, perceptions and, and behavior of of the police the police or the you know sort of powerful um, person in that context, I suppose. Just, just speaking to the question, I, I, I must admit to being a little bit confused about what what it means. The it says in the models, to what extent are malicious agents accounted for? Are you organised actors who start the interaction with enforcement from an antagonistic or aggressive position? So I'm assuming then that what's being meant here is that malicious malicious agent is a police officer. Uh, nice. Yeah. So. I, I think if, if that's the correct interpretation, I think where our research speaks more powerfully to this issue is, is the work that we did around police interviews and the construction of their own identities, because it was very evident in the way that officers talk about themselves, there are different senses of what it means to be a police officer. And that uh, sense of self is, as Matt points out, a theory of one's position in, relation, in social relations. So it is by definition a theory of the other as well. And I think that there's something in there about attributions of criminality. It's the, the, the way in which officers think about what's caused the crime can quite often influence their sense of how it should be policed and therefore what they should do in relationship to the interaction. So th I think that's quite an Im important point, but I think it's also important to point out that it's not necessarily malicious. It's just, you know, a different model, a different theory of the way that the world is and how it should work, and therefore a different theory of what it should be to be a police officer. So we need to put it on the table and just reflect on those different senses of identity within the police to understand the dynamics of the interactions that police officers have with members of the public. And that's as an important part of analysing their approach to procedural fairness as simply focusing on on abstracted and universal rules yeah I, I think that discussion gets really to the to the heart of what i was trying to say so from the perspective of let's say kind of classic or or, or, or traditional pursuit justice theory um it doesn't matter whether the malicious actor is involved or not because all that matters is whether the individual on the receiving end perceives that interaction as procedurally unjust or unjust the the in intentionality of, of the police officer is is immaterial in that sense, I and mean, I think what 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 you try to what we are trying to argue here is is if we're really to understand how police public interactions play out in the real world, you can't ignore the intentionality of the other actor. Um, and I think one of the reasons, I think one specific reason why that specific question hasn't often been considered in pursuit justice research is because, ironically, for a theory that's concerned only with public perceptions, pursuit justice research has been quite police centric. So it's, it's quite been often done from the perspective of the police. And often since it's from the perspective of the police, kind of it's quite tricky to talk about bad actors within that context. So those kinds of discussions have been rather pushed to one side. Um, the next question is, is from, from Sarah. And then this goes to the heart of what I th certainly Arabella was saying, I think others of you as well. Um, and she says, I wonder um, what your thoughts are in terms of the ability of the public to shape the encounter according to their own self identity self-identity or whether the power of the officers to categorize people might override that in other words how do the power dynamics of the encounter enable the less powerful to control their own identity i can i can go for that one because I, th I think the work that we conducted actually highlights two instances whereby the police become the less powerful so i talked about um the power, the power dynamics between the authorities and how that highlighted the importance of considering the other actors present in police public interactions. And I think this context was unique in that the police actually stood back and let the what we might assume to have been the less powerful charity workers um, to actually have a lot of power in shaping how interactions actually played out. 
Um, and then moving to the second instance and going back to this whole metaphor of playing the game, um, I think the analysis of the street population as an active audience revealed that the power relationship between the police and the policed is very often multifaceted. So life on the streets um, is a place and a good example whereby routine architectures of power can be and are reversed, even if only momentarily um, through all the ways that I sort of covered in my presentation. I'd, I'd like to speak to that as issue as well, if I may. I mean, it, it reflects for me more saliently in relationship to the work that we do on police citizen encounters in the context of, of crowd events. And, and, and there so in particular football. Now I know there's a tendency to kind of perceive football crowds as sitting over there, but they are public citizen encounters with the police. And what's evident in that is that categorization, the kind of categorization that Leanne was talking about is absolutely central to how people in football crowds are policed. Once you get categorized by the police as a risk fan, then you can expect attention for the rest of the day. But that doesn't stop so-called and so categorized risk fans working dynamically across the event as a whole to shift and shape the dynamics of uh, power. And indeed to use the categorization of, of risk fan in which they effectively become disempowered to the police to find their own empowerment and to create creatively empowerment opportunities within that dynamic interaction across the time at which the event plays itself out. So what, what I think we're talking about here and what we're touching upon and in particular in Arabella's uh, analysis is, is that very kind of micro sociological dynamic of power that plays itself out in the context of police citizen interactions. So if we might refer back to one of the examples, who was powerful and who was powerless when the homeless person got up from one side of the street and went on to the other because it was in another borough? Now that seems to me to be a very subtle shifting of the power relationship that is going on in that interaction in a very complex microsociological way that again needs to be taken into account if we want to understand the dynamics of police citizen encounters. Stuff. Can I, Ben, sorry to interrupt, if I could just add a little bit on that point as well. Um, I think perhaps focusing um, more closely on, on some of the dyadic interactions that I had um, observed as well. I think identity and, and this notion of power and, and the way that interactions um, go about really all intertwined very nicely in examples like um, that's a religious symbol you've got on your necklace there. I'm, I'm trusting you and, and I'm going to be respectful and say you, you can carry on wearing that if you if you behave and if, if you're good, I'll, I'll reward you with with that, um, with the ability to keep that necklace on um, with with that religious symbol being a part of that person's identity and who they are. Um, I think somebody had a, a particular pair of football socks on um, and, and that really kind of guided the interaction once the custody officer had seen, oh, no, you're not a fan of so-and-so team and and that really kind of guides the interaction in that sense that that kind of the identity that citizens bring into their interactions with the police can also be picked up on by officers to to be built into that procedural fairness and, and the justice of, of an interaction to, to bring that back and say okay i i can respect that is an important part of your life or and, and your identity and, and kind of bring that all back together to this um you know element of procedural justice and how it might operate in, in those interactions. Thanks, Leah. Excellent. So um, just a very quick question from Mark. Is, does anyone mind if we don't share our slides um, with the attendees? OK, we'll, we'll email those out afterwards. Um, uh, Carolyn uh, says, um, I wonder, has there been any work done or would it be worth doing a longitudinal study on a group of police officers to assess how concepts of PJT and ideas of fairness change over the course of an officer's career. The idea, idea, being, how, the idea being how to assess how to assess how experience, lived experience, affect police legitimacy over time. Has anyone got any thoughts on that? Cliff? Just an immediate one for me, if I may. I, th I think really exciting question because it's in part what we're trying to suggest here that it's important to study things longitudinally. 
But I would suggest that those changes are evident in an officer's shift, not, not just a, a whole career, that they're so dynamic. The, the data that Leanne was pulling out from her field work of response officers in particular was showing how the way in which sort of fairness and legitimacy was, was being, was changing, was, was going from one call to another. That, that in fact, the previous call and how the experience had played itself out there affected the next one and, and so on and so forth. So I think that that sort of dynamism is really quite uh, profound, even in, in the microcosm of a shift, let alone a career. But absolutely, I would say, well, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could do that? I'm sure there are studies, but um, not, not known to me. Yeah, I was, I was just going to mention <coughs> Sarah Charman's work. I think she's, she's on the call now, but um, I, her work's looked at, you know, sort of how police identity changes across a number of years. So you know, to, to a large extent, you know, this work is sort of ongoing and, and I agree that it's, it's, it's very important to, uh, to study it in this way, for sure. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I've seen a couple of um, uh, studies that followed people um, through the train academy, training academy out into the field, um, one from Australia and one from Taiwan, both, both really good, quite high quality longitudinal studies. And, and rather depressingly, both of those studies um, suggested that, that people coming into the police had the highest, most favourable perceptions towards doing procedural justice, let's put it like that. Um, and that favourability declined over time and it particularly declined when they went out of the academy and into the field. And that was the case, but in, in, in cultural contexts, as in some senses, dissimilar as, as Australia and, and Taiwan. So I suspect you'd find that in lots of contexts as well. Has anyone else got anything on that question? I might just quickly add that although it's... Um not the longitudinal piece that we perhaps need. Um, we're starting to conduct some analysis around an idea of self-legitimacy as well and, and officers sense of their own legitimacy and how that changes over experience and training and, and those things which, which also tie into that, I think, um, and, and are starting to really interestingly come out of the, the observational data as well. I mean, ben, sorry to sort of um, step in again, but I think, I think again, just sort of bringing this analysis into the contemporary context, let's just reflect on how much COVID has changed the context of what is legitimate to police. And it, again, it sort of reminds us that uh, police legitimacy is fluid. It is dependent on, on, on context. And one of the unusual things about COVID is how it has fundamentally changed the context that we previously assumed was fixed, but it's not because clearly it can change and it does change. And when it does change, the, what is legitimate to police, self-legitimacy, um, the, the, the gray zone about the enforcement of guidance versus laws all becomes immensely problematic and has become immensely problematic for the police and the public. Which actually leads me into the, uh, what may be the final question, depending on how long you take to answer it. Um, this is from Alain. Uh, and he said, we had now heard presentations with different participants, and we also heard that legitimacy cannot, cannot always be achieved. Did you find any commonalities among different projects or settings on how interaction and dialogue should look like in order to promote legitimacy? So can you identify relevant factors for a training of police officers in terms of producing legitimacy in their actions? I'll just very, very briefly say something, because I think this was true amongst um, all, all, both mine and Leanne's uh, field work, that a lot of the time it wasn't just the interaction itself that formed the public's perceptions of how legitimate the police was or was not. And a lot of the time it was other things that formed the public's perceptions of the police. Um, I talked about this in my presentation, so I won't reiterate here, but for members of the street population, it was very much other social processes that formed um, their perceptions of the police and how legitimate or not they perceived them to be um, things to do with their history, histories um, of involvement with the police and not necessarily what was going on then and there in that particular interaction. Yeah, I think that's really what I was pick, go, going to pick up on, this idea that I, I think appreciating the difference of different contexts, um, understanding that the impact that history might have on, on that interaction, but also appreciating that this is an immediate interaction and, and perhaps 
not going in with, with information from 15 years ago that suggests this is a high risk context in which we're placing ourselves um, and the way that an interaction is approached uh, I think is key but but I think the key point that we're, we're all drawing out is that actually it's it's so complex that it's not as simple as what does procedural justice or, or fairness look like um, generally that actually it's really context um, specific and like Cliff said we're working to produce some um, training packages so hopefully um, we can we can begin to develop that with officers about you know what what about this context would be fair or what does fairness look like in that context with this group of people or this individual um, so I think understanding context and, and the role of history in 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 those interactions is really important mm. and that, so so to so slightly push back against that I, I think my, my response to that question would be um, well, a key part of procedural justice is explaining your decisions to the people affected by them. Um, and we might want to take it from a normative perspective that that's just what the police should do. Doesn't, doesn't matter if it generates legitimacy. I mean, a couple of you touched on this anyway. That's just the way that people should behave in relation to others, which, which creates one immediate barrier, which is convincing police officers that is something they should just do because it's the right thing to do. Once you've got over that barrier, I think, then then a whole of other set of processes come in that they don't make explaining your decisions complicated to do because that's relatively easy to do what they do mean is are you expected to explain your decisions are you placed under such time pressures that you feel you haven't got time because you need to get to the next call um are you you usually explain your decisions to people you think the person in front of you is not worth it because they're a screw and you want to get you think they just get them in the back of the van it's those kinds of things that complicate it the explaining your decisions bit is actually quite simple and should usually be possible in most contexts where police officers are interacting with people. It's all the external pressure on that encounter, some of which is going to come from inside the police officer themselves, of course, but which more often is going to come from the context within their worksheet working. It's that external pressure that means that often they don't explain their decisions to people and people who experience those interactions are particularly unfair because they don't understand why a decision has been reached. So I think I think it's 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 understanding how actually a set of really quite simple things that most people can do in most conversations they're having with other, pe other people become really difficult in certain policing contexts. That, that to me is the real take home from a lot of this. Um, have we got time for one more? Um, yes, one more uh, from Tony, last question. Um, I like the playing the game analogy regarding police homeless interactions. Police don't have the ability to end homelessness yet. There's a feeling we are expected by citizens to police aspects of criminal offending by this community. Um, what's the answer to improving PJT? I think improving the fairness of the interactions um, with this particular group, Arabella, I think that's one for you. Yeah, yeah, thank you. I think that that's a, a really good question. Um, so today I talked about how relational concerns might not motivate compliance in this context for, for various reasons. Um, but we've also conducted more research um, with the street population and have found that um, deterrence-based approaches don't do much um, to motivate compliance either so police deterrence approaches so I, I think that's something that's really coming out of our work is that um, for this kind of group of regular customers that are the street population that do encounter police on a daily basis I think perhaps when it comes to policing neither relational or deterrence based strategy might really work and I think the move might have to be more um, more a, a non-policing answer to this so charities and local councils perhaps playing playing a bigger role than they currently do thanks arabella and that is with wonderful timing i think just about bringing us to the end and we've we've run out of questions as well so thanks everyone for attending today i hope you found that interesting thanks to the uh four presenters are for absolutely fascinating i suppose i would say that um but <laughs> really great stuff um do keep tuned for other events um hosted by the institute for Global City Policing and our colleagues and partners. Um, thanks very much and goodbye. And if the uh, the presenters could stay on the line, uh, please, just for a couple of minutes. Thanks everyone for attending.